once everything is organized and you can play back your timeline and you know that everything is working as it should one of the most common things that I usually do is to to match the actual offline with the video track one so we're gonna just make sure that it's actually matching and for that we can use some of the viewers uh, a and b functionality so for this to happen I'm going to select my view one once I select my track view one I'm gonna press one so now the track one is on buffer number one this is a bit like nuke then I'm gonna select my reference track and I'm gonna press two so that the reference track is on my buffer number two once now I can see that on my menu on my viewer I can see a and B and I'm gonna put my viewer to full screen so I can show you and once I'm here you can see that up here I have a choice to stack them to put them horizontally or vertically and then of course I have blending modes and I also have a wipe tool just like nuke and as you can see the wipe tool gives you the ability to see really up and close if your offline is matching or not and then you can just play it and basically double check if it's if it's uh, working or not for those of you that prefer to see it side by side you can always turn off the wipe and put a horizontal stack horizontal stack will give you the ability to see the two edits side by side playing in real time and this is very impressive because I mean you have to understand that I actually of course all of us usually work on very powerful workstations but just so you know I am making this tutorial on a MacBook Air with basically a Fi 800 hard drive and I am because everything is to RAM because everything is cached to RAM I still have the ability to even on a small laptop to play back full HD DPX 10-bit log files side by side with the quick time of the offline which is very impressive so once I'm happy with my offline and that the fact that actually everything is matching I then can go ahead and start developing the template of the exporting of this edit before we do that though I am also going to explain to you that very often on commercial a lot of times we do do edit changes in the fly many times the client can come in and sometimes edit changes can happen very quickly just so you know usually the procedure would be that the edit would be changed and you would get a new EDL but many times an edit can be changed even in the fly inside of hero just so you know you can also export your edit back to Final Cut if you make changes and this is very easy to do so we'll start by doing that first so that we can see that working and then we'll go back to do the exporting EDL. So let's imagine for a second here that we've made an editorial change. Let's say, for example, that shot eight and nine are going to have a different trim place. Let's imagine that now they cut here instead of where they were on the offline. And let's say, for example, also that shot 11 to 10 is also different. So let's imagine that there's a few edit changes along the way. The easiest way for you to export an EDL or even an XML out of Hero is to just start by locating where your EDL is. We only have one EDL on this project. <clears throat> Once you're there, you can basically right click and say export. Now, the export window will pop up. The export window is where we are going to mainly stay most of our time now at this stage on the tutorial. <clears throat> this is where Hero really shines. The way for you to build presets and templates for each production you do. As you can see, you have options of exporting as a sequence, as clips, if you have selected just one clip, which I haven't, or you can process the entire timeline as shots. 
we're going to start by the sequence. So processing a sequence gives you a choice of making an ADL and XML. As you can see, we already have presets that create the relevant export capability that you want. So as you can see, we have a present for EDL and a present for XML. So let's say that we want to export this entire sequence as an EDL. I'm going to start by on the top say, I want to export to a certain part. At the moment, it's going to the project root. I don't want it there. So let's say that we click and we give a new place for the exporting to happen. So I'm going to make a folder here called to final cut. So this is a folder where we've made a new edit because that edit was made. I'm also going to make a date for it as well. So I'm basically going to say that was an edit done on the 2012 month 11 X day. And now that I've chosen where to save my ADL or XML, I'm going to close this and I'm going to basically say, okay, this is the path where I basically want this exporting to happen. And I'm going to press OK, open. <clears throat> so now that the path is organized, what can you do here? <clears throat> because this present was already made, I'm going to make a completely fresh present so that I can teach you the steps of doing this. So if you want to make a new present, you can press the plus button on the project presets, or you can press the minus to delete something. You can also press the duplicate uh, uh, menu so that you can make a new one. I'm going to duplicate this and I'm going to call this present called to final cut. <clears throat> I'm going to delete everything that I've done so far here so that you we can start over. So this new present is called to final cut. It's exporting to the folder that we gave him. And as you can see down here, we have a path and a content. We also have capability to have folders. We have a capability to have plus and minuses. Now, I'm going to press the plus button. And as you can see, the default is file name. And this curly bracket that you can see inside the file name is really where the whole template system exists. This is the way that you have to give him certain certain tags for him to create certain types of exports. If you leave the mouse uh, or the Wacom pen over the file name, you can see that you have quite a few options to use. You can, for example, have the day of month, the year, so that it creates a folder with that name. You can also create the name of the project, the name of the sequence, the user. You can always create all of that. So let's say, for example, that we want to have the name of the sequence because the sequence is now called cut 22. So the only thing you need to do is you need to do a curly bracket and then you write sequence and then you close with another curly bracket. Now, whenever in doubt for the exact spelling of the uh, of the actual keywords that you're going to put, always leave the mouse and it will give you the spelling for all the keywords you can use. So now I know that my ADL will have the name of the sequence at least. Now, not only that, but I also wanted to have the name of the track so that each EDL gives me the name of that specific track. So I'm going to put an underscore and again, I'm going to do another bracket and I'm going to say that I want the track to be also named inside my name. So now you can see that, for example, if I have a sequence called Ermin Cut 22, then that will be the name of my sequence. Then it will be an underscore and then if it's track one, it will be called track one. Now, besides that, I'm also going to make sure that the date is in the name so that I know what day this was made. So for that to happen, again, you can put another score and then you can put bracket day. And then you can put bracket 
month, which is mm, sorry, and then year, which, well, we don't need to put the year. It's going to be a bit too much information. And then once you're ready with the actual name of what you want to create, you can go into the content tab and click on it and you have a choice of making transcoding an image, an EDL, an XML or an audio. I'm going to click EDL. So I click EDL. Down here I have a few options. I can have the absolute path and the real name in my EDL if I want to which usually is not a norm, usually it's a procedure that it's not very common to do. I can also change it to bring the entire sequence or just the in and outs. I can also change so that the starting point is another frame than the, what I have on the sequence. And of course, I can also select what actual tracks I want to export. Now, also important, once you're happy with the template you have, which you're going to reuse quite often, you also should be always saving it. I'm going to press save, and there you go. So let's click export and see what happens, and then I can show you exactly what happened. So I'm going to click export. The export window will open. Of course, it's going to take very little time because it's only an EDL. But as you can see, it tells you here 100% done. It's all finished. It's called, it's from the template called Final Cut. And if you open here and here, it says it was an EDL export task, it was finished, and that's the location where it's living. I'm gonna click the little icon here so that I know and I see the folder where it was saved to. And as you can see, this is the folder I created inside of it we have the EDLs. All the EDLs, as you can see, have basically the name of the edit, which was Ermin Cut, and like just like the, the, the sequence, just like the template, you see sequence, Herman Cut 22, then we have the track, grade 709 sign V2, and then the date, the 18th, the month, the 11 EDL. And as you can see, this is one of the most powerful things because now these EDLs are ready for a Final Cut operator to open. The next time you have another edit change, because we've done an expression to pick up the day and the month, it will change the name of the EDL with a new date so that you never lose track of what is the latest, the latest EDL. Of course, this can be done by a lot of ways. You don't need to do it by date. You could have done it by versions. It would also be as effective. But we're just scratching the surface here. You will see when I go into the project by process by shots, you see how powerful all of this can become.